Hello, once again, Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. And every oblation of your meat offering shall you season with salt. Notes. Now, salt is a preservative, obviously, and therefore serves as a type in the Old Testament of the Word of God. Scripture. Neither shall you suffer the salt of the covenant of your God uh, to be lacking from the meat offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. Notes. It, it, it's called the salt covenant. The, it, it, it is called the salt of the covenant, referring to the enduring character of the covenant. Uh, God himself has so ordained it in all things, which means that nothing can alter it, and no influence can ever corrupt it, because it is the unalterable, unchangeable, indescribable, and eternal word of Almighty God. Now the salt proclaims, Thus saith the Lord, and as much, and as such, runs at... Uh, runs at cross purposes with men's desires. Every true preacher of the gospel will have his message uh, seasoned with salt if they are actually the true preacher. That's in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Jesus talking about, you know, people losing their saltiness, or you are the salt of the earth. You can also find a little bit more in Corinthians uh, chapter, or no, Colossians chapter 4, verse 6. I almost gave the readers and listeners wrong notes and I may have done that sometimes and I do apologize if I'm wrong about the scriptures verse 14 and if you offer a meat offering of your first fruits unto the Lord you shall offer for the meat offering of your first fruits green ears of corn dried by the fire even corn beaten out of full ears notes uh, they didn't actually have corn in that part of the world so this is a translational error uh, in, in the proper word, as I believe I've said in the book of Genesis, like a dozen times, uh, it's actually for grain. That's, I mean, I, th I think you can find that in your Strong's Concordance and trace it back to the Hebrew, but uh, uh, we'll just continue. Now, the meat offering was not a sin offering, but rather a sweet savor offering. Uh, thus, its meaning is... Uh, it's definitely fixed. And moreover, the intelligent interpretation of it must ever guard with holy jealousy the precious truth of Christ's spotless humanity and the true nature of his associations uh, which the meat, op uh, the meat offering actually represented. Verse 15. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering. And the priest shall burn the memorial of it part of the beaten grain thereof and part of the oil thereof with all the frankincense thereof it is an offering made by fire unto the Lord notes inasmuch as part of the meat offering was burned in the fire and part eaten by the priest we should understand that this symbolized Christ in his perfect life but yet uh, a life that would be given on the cross hence the burnt offering of the meat offering on the altar. Now this signifies as well that Christ came to the world, but for one purpose, and that was to actually go to the cross. His life was perfect, his demeanor was perfect, his way was perfect, his manner was perfect, and all for the purpose of being a perfect sacrifice. I mean, people really don't understand what Jesus really did at the cross, and I don't think in this life we ever fully will. Chapter 3. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it to if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Notes. The burnt offering pictured Christ dying, while the meat offering Christ living. The peace offering presents him as making peace by the blood of his cross, and so establishing for man's uh, communion with God. In both the peace offering and the trespass offering, we learn of the presence of the sin nature in the heart and life of the believer. But we find out even more fully in the peace offering that even though the sin nature dwells in us, it is not to rule in us. That's in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Cut it out! Stop barking. Sorry about that. I got a mud over here yakking. Verse 2. 
and he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering. Notes. This portrays the beautiful doctrine of substitution and identification. The, uh, the animal became the substitute in the sinner's place, and by the laying of his hand or hands on the head of his offering, he identified with that substitute. And that is, in effect, in, it is the heart of the gospel, really. Uh, Christ became our substitute, and we identify with him in all that he did, but more particularly, what he did for us at the cross in particular. Scripture. And you shall kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. No, the person who brought the sacrifice had to personally actually kill it. And that's not very pleasant, and these things were not designed to be pleasant. Scripture. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Notes. The sinner trusted in what the sacrifice represented, and its blood was sprinkled on the altar round about. For fellowship is encircled by atonement, and only exists within it. Thus God and the worshiper were brought into fellowship. And it symbolizes, and it's kind of like uh, peace being established. Its eternal and unshakable foundation was not the worthfulness of the worshiper, but the preciousness of the sprinkled blood. And I will say it again, that these things were done, and they were, they were designed to actually be very unpleasant for the person. I mean, could you imagine just picking up a puppy dog and slitting its throat and spraying blood all over the place? All of this was actually symbolic of the awesome price that was going to be paid at Calvary. And, quite frankly, the dog would be symbolic of, you know, an innocent victim, really. Verse 3. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covers the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. Notes. The fat and the blood symbolize the priceless life and the precious inward affections of the Lamb of God, which is Christ. Verse 4. And the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall be taken away. And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Verse 6. And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Notes. Now the male or female of the animals being allowed stipulates that all, both man and woman, can have fellowship and peace with God. Verse 7. If he offer a lamb... For the offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. Notes. Whether the poor man's lamb or goat were offered, or the rich man's heifer, all were precious in God's sight, and received uh, basically the same. We will have to continue in Leviticus chapter 3, verse 8. Thank you very much. <laughs>